Hello, my name is Steve Emery Wright, and welcome to this session two of How to Read the Bible. This week we're going to explore the development and translation of Holy Scripture and how this is uh, very helpful for us today in, in understanding how we read the Scripture and the importance of the church uh, historically and the church today in the way we interpret scripture. The weeks that follow the next four sessions after this, we'll look at the specific rules of how to interpret the Bible, how to actually delve into it, and then the rules for how we apply that for today's culture and today's people. Sessions four, five, and six We'll look at the specific genres of the Bible and the different rules and understandings and ways these were written and therefore should be interpreted today. So let's review a bit. Last week we talked about the very nature of Scripture, the role of Scripture. We said the Holy Quran or the Quran was, was dictated. The words of God written down word for word by Muhammad. That's how the Muslim people understand it. Where Christians throughout history have understood our holy scriptures as God inspiring individuals, particular people, and you'll see their personality as they write. So God inspires people within their cultures and historical contexts to write messages that are specific to that context, but also have eternal implications. And this Holy Scripture God uses to speak through, uh, or speak through this Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit to awaken and nurture our faith and provide ethical direction for us. It becomes God's word for us. So how did this come about? Have you thought about that at all? Have you thought about how those 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament came to be? Well, the Old Testament uh, was written over around uh, 1,200, 1,300 years but by 400 BC, uh, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, universally accepted the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, as inspired by God, holy scriptures. They refer to this as the law. And then over the next 100 years, 200 years after that, the prophets were written and they became authoritative. Actually, the prophets were written earlier as well. But they became authoritative and informally, the Hebrew people began to see this as their holy scripture. In fact, I have a, a picture here of the Greek Septuagint that was written just before, just before 200 BC. The Septuagint, this Greek translation, was accepted by the Hebrew people for about two or 300 years, and it had all of the prophets, almost all of the prophets, and it had uh, the, the Book of the Law, and it ha also had some of the historical writings. Uh, by 100 BC, all the historical writings, the whole Old Testament as we understand it, was viewed by the Hebrew people as canon. Now the New Testament. <laughs> I don't know if you've read Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code or saw the movie, but you'll hear about hidden books and books that didn't make it into the New Testament that have, that have been discovered. Well, they've always been known of. We, the church has always been aware of these. They simply 
did not consider them as Holy Scripture. Interesting, sometimes informative, but not inspired by God. So let's take a look at uh, what did become Scripture for us and how it came about. Uh, you remember the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that says, all scripture is God-breathed, uh, useful for teaching and reproving. When they wrote that, when, when Paul wrote that, he didn't have the New Testament in mind because it hadn't been written yet. And Paul was not writing these letters for them to become Holy Scripture, but the church recognized that they were inspired by God in a powerful way. In fact, there were certain criteria that the early church looked for, even before the New Testament came together, for Scripture, for writings that they considered to be authoritative. These were the person writing it, was related to Jesus in terms of being either a disciple or close to the disciples, so authorship. Secondly, consistency. Was it consistent with what Jesus taught? And was the understanding consistent? Thirdly, acceptance by the church. Did the church have agreement that this was inspired by God and spoke to the church Today. So you have those three criteria. Uh, let me show you this chart here. You'll see that the last scripture was written, New Testament was written around the end of the first century, uh, very close to the end of the first century, although some scholars dated a little uh, the revelation of John a little later than that. Irenaeus by A.D. Uh, 180, quoted, it says here, all but four of the books. Uh, well, it was actually six that he didn't refer to. So you see, even at that time, 180, uh, that many of the books, the Gospels, the four Gospels we have today, they were all agreed on. The letters of Paul that were, were uh, most clearly the letters of Paul were agreed on. Uh, there were a few others, such as Philemon, Hebrews, James. Hebrews because they didn't know who wrote it. James, Second Peter because of the difference in style from First Peter, uh, Third John, Jude, and Revelation. Those were the ones that were in dispute. And there were some that didn't make the final cut that were also in dispute. And Revelation for some, for the Western Church was difficult, as you can well imagine. Uh, the Eastern Church loved it, the Western Church didn't. So there we have the New Testament coming together, but it wasn't formalized until 397, a specific council. Now, by that time, those 27 books were pretty well agreed on but it was formally accepted as inspired by God at the Synod of Hippo in 397. So we believe as the church that these original documents that, that Paul or, or Peter or, or John or James sat down and wrote, we believe that those originals were inspired by God. But have you ever heard someone say to you, I mean, I get it all the time, well, the original was inspired, but what we have today are translations from translations, and that was 2,000 years ago, and, and today, well, it, it's probably changed so much. There's an easy answer to those people who have that criticism, and it's an understandable criticism. No, that's not the case. What we have today is more accurate than they had a thousand years ago. And let me explain why. If we believe, there's a, 
little odd chart here, but if we believe that top box up there that says X originals of Y, that top box is the original inspired uh, book of Matthew, say. Well, there were several copies of that made. And then there were several copies of that made. And then there were several copies of that made. And each of those copies has an error or two errors or three errors or slightly different wording. Instead of saying, uh, with God, they might say, uh, with the Lord, just very minor errors. Uh, but they would make different errors. So we would be able to trace back if, if one made uh, said one thing, but the two others said something else, you could begin to see where the error came from and you could begin to see uh, what was right and what wasn't right or what the original said and, and or didn't say. Now you've got to remember we have thousands of these, literally thousands of these fragments and in some cases full copies of scripture. Fragments dating back to the second century. So there is much material to draw on. And because these discoveries of these ancient fra fragments have been made over the last 2000 years, uh, what we have today is more than they've ever had in history. And also it's accessible because it's online to all translators. Let me show you what I mean. This is uh, the Greek Bible, uh, cha uh, John chapter 13. And you'll see in the bottom there, there's a little footnote for verse 18. It seems in verse 18, there's a little variant. And what they do in the Greek text, I have a Greek Bible that does this, you'll see that they put the variant. And they don't just put the variant, they put all the book, all the little fragments that have certain variants. And you soon begin to know what what's good and what's not good. This one, interestingly enough, there's very good fragments that have both the variant and the one that we have in our text. And what is it? Well, really there's no difference in the translations. Um, one emphasizes my crops, my barns. Uh, the other is a weaker version of mine. Uh, we think the weaker version of mine is, is probably right, uh, but really they're both saying the same thing. So you can see uh, the differences that are there, we know. And we also know whether we're sure or not about it, of it, because they rate each difference, A, B, C, or D, or, or E, simply, we don't know. And they footnote it in the best translation. So if you look in your Bible, and your Bible is an NIV or, or uh, and RSV, you'll see in the margin or in the footnote, and it will say some ancient manuscripts say, boom. So actually what we have today is very accurate. And in fact, it's more accurate than any other ancient book that we have. If you take a look at this chart, you'll see those first two columns, the New Testament in Greek, in the New Testament in all languages, those two together, uh, well, that's nearly 29,000 fragments or manuscripts from that. And if you look at all the other ancient books listed there, you'll see we have very little, very little. The Bible has been preserved by the holy nature and by the grace of God. So, we have the New Testament, New Testament, we have the Old Testament, and we know how historically accurate it is. In fact, you, you may be aware of the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in, uh, well, around 1948, and subsequently uh, there were others discovered. Uh, 
And those ancient scrolls that dated back to the time of Christ, some of them, even earlier in the book of Isaiah, what they did was emphasize how accurate the scriptures that we now have actually are. So, what is the best translation to use? I always like to say the best translation is whatever translation you will read. But let me take just a minute to explain uh, a little bit of the differences in translations. Some are very word for word in the way that they translate. The King James and the New King James are not particularly good translations because they did not have access to the variety of Greek uh, and Hebrew manuscripts that we have today. It was based on a flawed manuscript and therefore has some serious errors in it. But it was a very word for word as a New American Standard Bible is. But then you get to some other translations. We use NIV fairly often today. Uh, the NIV and the New Revised Standard and the Revised Standard are more of a thought for thought translation. What they're seeking to do is convey what the original said in English rather than a wooden word for word translation which may not convey the meaning, meaning that we're looking for. What translations do I use? Well, I use the NIV right here and I use uh, for my daily devotions, I use the new, uh, the new Revised Standard Version, which is a very academic uh, version, uh, vocabulary that makes it sometimes un unsuitable for, for children. Uh, um, I think it's written at a first year university level. And then I use the Contemporary English Version, which is more toward a paraphrase, but is still a thought for thought. Sometimes when I preach or speak to young people, I will use a paraphrase, such as the Living Bible or the Message. These are less accurate, but, but I say less accurate, but the, sometimes they're better at conveying the idea in the passage than a literal translation or a thought-for-thought -thought translation. Well, we're all set now to begin next week delving into scripture. Uh, let me give you before that uh, several questions for your group to explore this week or if you're looking at these individually for you to think about and maybe uh, maybe even write down some thoughts. Here are the questions. What are challenges you have heard people make about the Bible and how did you respond? Secondly, what are your thoughts about the church deciding what we consider is the Bible? So those early councils and early church leaders saying this was inspired, this isn't inspired. And third, what translation of the Bible do you use and why? What went into the decision, your decision, for using that scripture? Well, thank you all. And I pray even right now that as your groups discuss it, as you dive into the scripture, that God in the power of his Holy Spirit will open our minds and hearts. Amen.